Welcome to episode 44 of Who We're Gonna I Fucking Fuck Today. Uh, well, all right, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. Oh, yeah, just give up. Is that what you do in the gym? Because no. a little birdie, a little bird just told me, listen to this, everyone. Connor, I mean, I, I'm, I mean, if you listen, listen to this, you can't see it, but I'm talking to Connor now, I, I can see him. And he actually looks more muscular than he did yesterday, because... Connor's been to the gym today. He looks like a right fucking beefcake. I'm a beefcake baby. I've had chicken breast. I've got some protein on the way. Ooh. Yeah, I did a workout for the first time in over a year today. Bloody hell. And, How did it so, feel? You're going to be so. What did you do? Uh, I'm just following a... I, I, I just needed something simple because I always overcomplicate things. I always research it to the, the nth degree. I've uh, noticed... I, I, I stick to it for a little while and then I go, oh, fuck this, and I blow it up. So I was like, you're not doing this this time. Hey, Connor, go on. Go, go, speak to Phil. We've got our own resident PT. I, I will do eventually. I just need to build the habit first. Otherwise, I know what I'm like. I know if what I don't have the habit there, there's no point paying someone because I'll just be like, fuck you, fuck this, fuck that. Uh, I need to have a good sort of routine there already and then I build upon it. I'm learning myself as I grow up, you know. So well, like why don't you again. Don't pay him. Just just trade a bit of um, Facebook ads work for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to him, but I, well, I Phil, definitely will no, talk to with, him. Seriously, Phil Agostino, this is for the listeners too. Phil Agostino, spelled exactly as it, spelled, as it sounds. Um, if you don't, if you don't, if you can't spell it, just email me. <laughs> it hurts up when I put me in touch. Well, if you can't spell it, go kill yourself. I, I uh, I, I worked for years to try and get my six pack until 2016. I always got so far and never quite hit it, you know? And then within within five months of working for Phil at the age of 51, 52 or something, 51, I had my six pack, almost 52. Um, and I could have done it in probably three and a half, four months if I hadn't had a couple of niggling injuries and a couple of breaks while I was traveling. Fucking remarkable. Yeah. And it's, it's not magic, shit. it's not complicated. You know, it's, it's just really, really dead simple and it's things like sticking to pita mayonnaise and and, and chicken <laughs> four times a day for the last five years you know <laughs> <laughs> phil gave an excellent talk at our uh, summit as well yes he did yeah it was really good that was i, I if, made sure if, I did you good. tell him oh yeah i said it was well i mean i've seen him do that one several times or i mean i've seen him speak several times that was by far the best because he changed his tack somewhat yeah I've seen him speak twice before that, and it was like a different person. He, he did really well. I was impressed. Well, in fact, it's quite opposite, really, because, you know, what he was doing effectively was nurturing, because he knows it all, and he, he, he's a constant kind of feature in, in those people's lives. He's always around. So what he was doing was effectively nurturing, and if you think about it, think back to what he talked about. He was not talking about the thing. Mm -hmm. He didn't talk about the result. He didn't talk about the solution. He, he talked about what it would mean to you to lose all that weight, the outcomes. And that's why it resonates with so many people. So Phil's doing, you know, he's, he's good. He's, he's one of the top guys, I reckon. Yeah, I will anyway. talk to him. In, but in terms of what I did, I'm just following a simple PPL uh, with resistance bands just to build the routine, get the yoga back in place. Yeah, get these, because since the move, everything's just gone out the window. Literally the healthy eating, the stretching, the walking, any exercise, it's just all oh. gone out the window. I, um, I'm not like you where you can just pick something up, all your routines and place it back down elsewhere. Um, no idea why, but I woke up, well, yesterday I was just miserable. I was just fucking, and the day before that, I was just fucking miserable. I, was, I just woke up this morning, looked at myself in the mirror, and I was like, you're not going to be miserable. And it was that simple. Well, what do I need to not be miserable? Well, have some good food, do some exercise. Right, you've got some resistance bands that you ordered for. 30 quid there and they've been sat there for two months using dickhead <laughs> you've got a yoga bat there that you bought for 30 quid i think you ain't used that once yet i can't remember it's fucking stupidly expensive fucking yoga mat 60 quid i'll check I must admit, I, i've spent literally thousands on my home gym over the years and my oldest stuff the 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 weight bench i was still using my olympic bar and the weights more than 20 years old and i've never regretted spending the money on it it's, it's been really because I mean, people say oh you never stick to it you know you'll give up after a while no i've 
I've, I've obviously been through periods where I've not used it so much, but I've pretty I've stuck through. I use it three times a week, four times a week, something about four times a week now. Your um, gym looks awesome as well. It's got such a cool like aesthetic. Well, it's got character. Man. Oh, it's, yeah, so it's a fucking cool. old barn. It's fucking hardcore. Oh, it looks um, proper. I bet you get a lot of satisfaction about slamming the fucking metal. <laughs> I tell you what, though, going back to feeling miserable. One thing I found. I mean, I, I I'm not generally one who gets no overly upset or bothered by these things or sucked into it but I, i've on my my phone i don't have linkedin or facebook um, or I, I have instagram because you because that's just like shit on a screen like this and there's a couple people i follow in the fitness industry and yoga um i've got email and obviously the things we use in the business but i don't have any any alerts on any alert that goes off is uh obviously the phone and texts proper texts you know um, and and teams we use for the internal comms in the biz. Otherwise, my phone's just fucking dead. It just sits there. And I don't, I don't have any news on there, no Google News, no BBC News, no, no journal. But I, I don't watch the news. I, I just don't follow the news. And it's it, even someone like me who does not get sucked into these things, I just find it so much, my day is so much cleaner. So sometimes, certainly like Mrs. EBG, Sarah, she, she, she would go, oh, that's interesting. Oh, what? You're just trying to engage in conversation, aren't you? I know it. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she'll say something like, oh, so-and-so's done something. Like, Why? I say what? Who cares? It's like the whole, so this old Meghan Markle thing, I, I know what it's about, but I didn't get involved. We'll have to get involved. I sit on the sidelines and laugh at it. It's pathetic. Yes, racism's wrong. Yes, this misogyny is wrong. But did anybody really expect any different from the royal fucking family? Yeah. Did they really? And uh, why are people getting upset by a, a bunch of fucking spoiled brats who've got more money than they'll ever spend? You know, what is the fucking wrong with these people? I mean, the whole thing is just so, I mean, different to the whole thing. And then today, apparently this um this, this girl, is it Sarah Everard? I think it's Sophie. I haven't looked into it at all. Sophie? How was it say on there? Sarah, no, it's Sarah, Sarah Everard. Oh, fair. That's how little um, I know. It, my, my LinkedIn feed and, and Facebook, and I logged on this morning to see what's going on, it, it just exploded. Um, and I didn't even know she'd gone missing, to be honest. But what I do, what I have noticed is, again, and this is another reason I steer clear of the news, because people are irrational. And the news is full of irrational people. Right, right now, we've got the found human remains, where they've not confirmed it, certainly the last I saw, they've not even confirmed it is this woman. That's the first thing. Second thing is they've arrested a police officer and he's being questioned. He's not been charged. He's not been convicted. All of a sudden, people are vilifying men again and, and indeed saying, if you can't feel safe from the police, who can you feel safe from? You know, we have due process to stop things like this because these things, you know, in, in an uncontrolled world without due process, you have people being strung up from lampposts because of the hysteria. And, you know, it's impossible it seems to have a rational debate about any of this because you've got women saying, and it is nearly all women saying, if you're not with us, if you're not speaking out, if you're not speaking out in the way we want you to speak out, then you're against us. Well, I I don't think what they're saying is correct. So I'm just not going to get involved. And it's a shame because they could actually benefit from someone like me because I'm I'm in complete agreement with 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 their ideals. You know, violence against women is wrong. And men should be bringing up boys not to abuse and commit violence against women. And they should be bringing up girls to report and stand against violence and not be afraid to talk about it to parents and teachers and all the rest of it. Absolutely. I'm in complete alignment with those, those goals. What I'm not in alignment with is they want the way they want to do it. I've even seen people saying men should not dress in a certain way, aggressively. Should Some people even say they shouldn't even have an ad- aggressive whatever that means, haircuts, and wear aggressive jewellery and have tattoos. Well, that isn't a million miles away from saying a woman shouldn't walk around in revealing clothes because of the effect it has on men, is it? Yeah, that's a dangerous thing they're saying. Well, yeah, so I absolutely, and I won't, I won't get involved in those kinds of conversations because as soon as you say, I agree with what you're saying, however, I've got a slight, you know, an objection to something you're saying. Oh, you're just that guy. You're not racist, but kind of thing. I'm not getting involved in that. And if you want, you know, you can tell me what you want and you can, or you can tell me what you want me to do. You can't tell me what to do and how to do it. You can't tell me both. It's just like the same as in business, isn't it? 
Start with Holly. We tell Holly what we want. We let her out and do it. <laughs> mm. Get it done. You know, I think yeah, if you know, just... it is incumbent on men to to raise boys to be men who are safe around women. Absolutely. I don't think it's incumbent on women to tell us how to do that. It's just mm. not. It's. I, if it I was, really if it was, why aren't they doing it now? <sighs> the thing is, if you if you live on a planet with other people, people by definition are irrational bad shit's always going to happen and from what i can gather something really fucking bad has happened here and it has awakened that inner fear that every female has um about walking home alone dark night and you know that's 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 understandable but the point is they're emotional and fair enough, but that means they're more than likely not behaving rationally. Emotional people usually do not behave rationally because the well, emotions have taken over. By definition. Yeah. By definition. So, and as you've said, you know, the, the police officer has just been arrested. There's been no charges or any, anything raised. So who the fuck knows what's happening there? As always, as these podcasts often end up at, if people just mind their own fucking business, we're just decent human beings, we're morally, yeah, morally on track, the world would be a far better place. But uh, we're never going to get there. And by introducing new laws, saying this, saying this should happen, this, that, and the other, it's just like whack-a-mole, right? You've whacked one thing, Absolutely. another thing's going to come up. It's It's just the world we live in and it's going to be reality now it'll be reality it was reality 100 years ago and it'll be reality in 100 years uh, well, the in the future the danger we face of course in anything like this is laws being rushed in to to cater to or to pander to vox populi and also this knee-jerk stuff which in hindsight proves to be more problematic you know you, you, things like you can you know it's not impossible to imagine laws against men wearing certain clothes that are too mm. aggressive you know that's not beyond the realms of possibility because if they can legislate in some countries against women's clothing well we you know that's the precedent set of, of legislating against clothing it's only a small step and i'm not saying this would happen but i know there are women out there who want it to happen because they say so and that would be ridiculous and after all Again, difficult as it may be for someone to get their head around, your feelings as a woman or a man are entirely on you. Now, if I'm walking down the street, no matter how aggressive I look, what I'm wearing, or what my face looks like, bearing in mind I've got a very aggressive face because of my alexithymia, all right, no matter what I look like, how you respond to me is entirely to you. Every woman is perfectly safe from me, unless you tax me or one of mine. You know, there's absolutely zero, a woman is in absolutely zero danger from it walking down the street. So how she feels about me and what I look like and how I'm, I don't know, swaggering or whatever. I'm sorry, that's just hard luck. I should not be expected to change anything about the way I look, the way I dress or anything else, just because somebody feels a certain way. I just shouldn't. I know it's tough, but that's just the way it is. In the same way as women should not be afraid to walk down the street and revealing clothes for because men feel a certain way after a certain age. Oh, I'm an old man. I can't have a woman like that. That shouldn't be allowed. You know, no, that's just tough. Life is a shit like that sometimes. We, we're men. We know what men are like. We know most men on this planet are pieces of shit. And Many of them certainly are. Oh, no. It's a, it's a I don't think most affairs. men... I don't think most men would use force against a woman. I would hope not anyway. No, no. But I'd, I'd say... I'd, 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 I'd say most men have committed some form of sexual assault in their life. Well, I haven't. Not that I've ever been yeah. called, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I certainly haven't. It's just rife in clubs. I don't think I've ever gone clubbing and not, you know, had a girl I know say I'm you know, he's going round oh, squeezing I know, bums. I know what you mean. I mean, the, the, in fact, the last guy as a doorman, the last person I punched in the face um, was doing that. He'd just come out of prison. He'd, just ro he'd, he'd robbed his mother's house to sustain his heroin addiction. Sold nice guy then. 
you know, came out of prison. Um, I punched, uh, he was, long story, I punched him in the face. Two weeks later, he committed suicide. So I thought that was a win. <laughs> You're like one punch man. <laughs> <laughs> one punch, two week delayed death. Uh, it, had nothing, it was completely unconnected, but uh, he, yeah, he overdosed on methadone and it was suicide. Oh, methadone. But, but the thing is, I, I, I didn't lose any sleep over. He was the waste of no. protoplasm. He was a piece of shit. The world is a better off. The world is a better place without people like him. Yes, genuinely. But yes, he was walking around squeezing but girls' bums and I threw him out of the club and punched mm. people. And so I, I, I believe women have, pretty much every female I've ever spoken to has been sexually assaulted, um, minor or majorly. So I, I believe they, they're entitled to feel a little bit. Oh, I'm not disputing that. Bro. No, I know you're not. I know no, you're not. Not for a second. I'm, I'm not one who's saying it doesn't happen. That's not what I'm saying. What, what I was is... going to say is that that shouldn't mean men should have to dress differently. Uh, no, that's no, absolutely. Very silly. Uh, no, it's... I don't know what the answer is, to be honest. It, it's there not is no answer. It's straightforward. Um, oh, <laughs> there are things we can do to ameliorate the situation. Men should be more vocal, I think, in, in teaching boys that these things are wrong. You know, it, 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 for instance, that guy who said to me all those years ago about he just slapped his wife the night before, and you got to slap him sometimes to keep me in check. You know, that should not be something a man can should be able to feel comfortable saying to his fellow men, thinking he's going to get, yeah, well, that's right, that is. That shouldn't be happening. You now, those groups of men should be being brought up better than that. Yeah, and it is incumbent on men to do that. I think part of the problem is men, boys, we said this before, men are brought up predominantly by women for most of the formative years. They should be around strong men who won't tolerate that kind of behaviour towards little girls, pulling them, you know, running around the playground, pulling their ponytails, pulling their bunches, because that's where it starts. That's just a bit of fun. You know, it's OK. Tickling them until they pee themselves and things, you know. That shouldn't be tolerated. But it's that's, no, you, that's where it starts. <laughs> Yeah, that's I know, but that's, that's, that's where it starts. <laughs> and, you know, boys should be around strong men who make it absolutely unequivocally clear that is not acceptable behaviour towards girls or boys or anyone. Non we should be fighting against non-consensual non -consensual violence against everyone. Because then let's start getting into the thing about where 40% of domestic abuse is perpetrated by women. Yeah. You can't even mention that without people saying, oh, yeah, you're just a white, straight white male, so you don't have an opinion. Well, you know, let's let's confront the whole situation. It isn't just violence against women. Yes, it mostly is, especially with strangers. But if you're going to talk about violence against people, non-consensual violence, let's talk about all of it. It's, it's a plague of society, and that kind of it echoes the point I was trying to make earlier. As long as there's people living on this planet, you will always be in danger. I actually saw someone post this morning on Facebook who said violence against women is unnatural but violence against men is is natural women again you know so violence against women is unnatural but violence against men is natural so it's okay that men get beaten up and hurt what <laughs> I, I couldn't quite get my head around it but hey that's what people are like and, and we're the problem right? clever we're the problem is he trying to be clever I, I, this was a woman this was a woman what a woman is she trying to I don't know. We're the problem, apparently, then. We're the problem. Nah. <laughs> Dude, you're asking the wrong man. I've got no idea what she meant. Baffling. Well, I know Baffling. what she meant, but God knows why she meant it. You know? mm. so I tell you one thing I don't like, though. Uh, and then, we'll try and, then we'll try and move past this. Is um, the men that get all really, really defensive immediately. And, uh, well, not all men are like that. It's like, shut up. Prick. Be objective. Stop getting defensive and thinking of yourself. It is, I mean, to obviously, be not all men are like that. It's like saying water's wet. Yeah, I know, but they're, well, okay. They're let's, let's, look that, at, so. let's look at that one for a minute. It is absolutely just true. Ignore not all men. It's insensitive to say it and probably irrelevant at times. But here's the thing: if you say to feminists, or a lot of well, a lot of women, if you say to women, okay, so let's talk about male violence, uh, when violence against men. Oh, it's extremely rare. Well, I'm a minute, so what? So what you're saying is just another way of saying it's not all women. That's really what you're saying. Yeah. But like I said, if we're going to talk about non-consensual violence, let's talk about all non-consensual violence. 
You know, how many women, at what point do the numbers become acceptable? Well, to me, one, just one makes it unacceptable. So it, it works both ways, you know. Uh, what about men who, you know, we should always believe women when they say they've been raped? Well, what about the women who lie about it? Oh, that, that doesn't happen very often. But if it happens once and it's believed, it's one too many fucking times. But again, you, you, it's difficult to express that opinion to anyone without being shouted down. Mm. Absolutely. My point is, it's, it's almost by the by. It's not all women uh, being violent. It's, it's not all men. And of course, there's distinct differences between men and women. But ultimately, people just need to be objective. Yeah. yeah no. All the same rational, smart people can look at this together um, and do what they can. But you're never going to stop crime. You're never going to stop violence. You can mitigate it. But um, I'd, I'd like to see a chart somewhere that shows more legislation and whatnot, especially against individuals such as men, women, minorities, whatever, um, where it actually leads to a decrease in violence, in violent crimes. Because even when states um, in America, for example, uh, ban guns or um, make the gun control laws looser or tighter or whatever. The violent... goes... When they loosen gun control, crime goes down. Exactly. And it's more like... people get shot, but that's because a lot of perpetrators are getting shot. Yeah. Oh, I ain't got a problem with that. That's <laughs> what I mean. Happen? People need to stop thinking so sort of one. But I don't know. Uh, I don't know an analogy. They're emotional. Yeah, one dimensionally. They just need to look at it objectively. Here's the numbers. Here's the stats. This is awful. What's happened? However, we're not going to be able to fix this overnight, and it will happen again. And the sooner we realise that, I don't know. The sooner people come to terms with reality, it will be a, a far more bearable place to live, rather than all of this finger pointing. You need to do this. You need to do that. No, hang on a minute. Slow down. No one needs to do fucking yeah. anything. Anyway. No. Anyway. <laughs> that was just well, <laughs> we just spoke for well, like right. 25 minutes on fucking we should uh, this should be a political podcast. <laughs> I fucking oh. hate politics. Oh, don't get me started. Joe John, Biden this... is going to be different now. Oh, not. <laughs> shut up. Shut up right now. I want to <laughs> I want you to talk on something. We are, we, we are very much set in strategy first and then tactical implementation later. Yeah. But we are into our gizmos. And uh, into I, know, I know you know a few things about uh, uh, the ultimate nurturing gizmo. Yeah. Well, really what we're looking at is systems. I mean, we talk about strategy versus tactics where basically strategy is a long strategy is long-term behavior tactics is, is short-term implementation in a nutshell um and if people as they often do you know what what's the best way to follow up well it's a bit of a strange question because you cannot possibly know the best way until you've tried them all uh, and that includes posting shit through the letterbox if you want to be completely honest about this otherwise you're just assume but the best way i've found is obviously consistent regular and often and by regular and often i mean something as as frequent as you can possibly manage and really that lends itself perfectly to a daily email there's, there's no reason on on in christendom for anyone not to be sending a daily email to their list there's not it can take you as little as 10 minutes to write sometimes it can take you longer if you have a lot to say but if you know if you write things the way i've been teaching people to write these emails for more than 10 years now you never allow things to say because you know it's not all about the thing you wouldn't be like a bricklayer sending a daily email about bricks every day you know i've written about all things i've written about abortion i've written about the change of the constitution in the uk i've, I've written emails in, virtually, in the last 12 13 15 years i've written emails in virtually every topic you can possibly imagine and none of them well, very few of them are actually about what I do as a business. There's always a tie-in, and that comes with practice. So daily email. And if you can't do it every day, you should be doing it at least four days a week. Yeah. 
So the day these people, your clients wake up or your prospective clients wake up and say, oh, today's the day we've got the extension to be built or the new bathroom, you are the person they're thinking. That's why we do it. Yeah, there's a mistaken belief that because people are not responding to what you're doing, they're not interested. That's rarely the case. They probably are, but just not yet. It's a case of no, but not no forever. Just no right now. And then, especially at the moment, for reasons I'll come to, that, um, direct mail. And direct mail is vastly underused. And again, people say, oh, it's, it doesn't work anymore. Well, that's, that's just bullshit. If it didn't work, then people wouldn't send letters anymore, and they do. But they don't use it for marketing as much anymore because of this mistaken belief that it doesn't work. And also, the, the, allure, the, the, the allure of the cheapness of going online. You, know, you can put a Facebook campaign together, and it costs you no money at all until you actually run it. Pay-per-click, you don't pay anything until someone responds to an ad. Compare that to direct mail, where you, you know, if you're, say, sending a letter out, you have to design it, you have to get it printed and then delivered. You've got an outlier. What was the last one we did? 3K for a mail shop? Uh, it was about that, yeah. About three grand. You've got to pay a, a lot of more. Money. Yeah, but yeah, it was about three, think about it, three and a half. You've got to pay yeah. three and a half grand, say, like we did, without knowing if you're going to get any response whatsoever. And we actually didn't. I think if you remember, we didn't get anyone, anything from that. So that, that I thought we got it. one. Yes, we did, because it paid for itself, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it paid for All right, itself. so we got one then. But we, don't, we certainly weren't in profit on it and possibly made a small loss if you consider the time it took me to put it together. But the point being, direct mail and, and again, you know, print advertising, it's speculative because you just don't know what the response is going to be. That's enough to put people off. But the very things that make it cheap, that, that make it expensive and, and, and speculative also make it attractive because if you are prepared to send letters and you don't have to start at three and a half K because we sent out a full color, 40 page sales letter in an envelope, you know, it was, it was a big deal. If you just send out one page of A4 or something, it's a lot less than that. Yeah. And, and if you're sending it with a new, uh, say a monthly newsletter, that is something your competitors are not doing. How many painters and decorators, brickies, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, bathroom people, kitchen people, bedroom people. How many of those do you know are sending out a paper newsletter? I bet there's not one. Or even there's... just one. Even just a fucking quarterly postcard. Yeah, just something. Now, again, they won't do it, but the thing is, right now, right now, postal rates are fairly low. There's almost no competition in, in your mailbox because no one's doing it. You know? When was the last time you re received a sales letter you know, for the post? Eight months ago. Who was that? Wonky-eyed wanker. Right. I haven't received a sales letter since I got stuff from Dan Kennedy in 2017. I don't think I've had any since then. Because Dan's been ill, as you know. Yeah, he has. I've received nothing from anyone. Nothing. And bearing in mind, we have, locally, we've bought a 50 grand Land Rover, a, 20, a 15K shed. Well, shed, it's an office. With everything that, go, with everything that goes in it. 1,000 euro desk, 1,500 euro fucking throne over there. Several hundred euros on bookcases. What else? That's just in this room, you know. And in the house, we've got sofas, TV. Not, not one. My bikes, about a thousand euro each. I've got three of them. Have I received any email even from the bike shop? No, nothing. And I am an ideal customer. I walk in. I've got money. I'm the right age. I'm, the, I'm their ideal client. Mm -hmm. I've got money, and it's just fucking fun for me. It's, it's pocket money. Would sell like a new bike, yes. Would sell like some biking shoes, gloves, a safety hat, possibly, high vis vest, cycling shorts, waterproofs. I'll have, I'll have, I'll have it all, mm. but they don't even bother. I don't ask, and I end up buying it online. No, it is cheaper, yeah, but I don't buy it because it's cheap. Bikes are convenient. Mm. They don't send me any dark mail either. Nobody does, and it's just it's almost criminal. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is with COVID. 
with people being stuck at home. And, you've, and this is this probably represents a, a three or four month window now before it starts getting. It, it can still be great, but you know this is this is the like, the prime time, right now. now people stuck at home. <laughs> For some people, the, the postman arriving is a highlight of their day because otherwise they've got fucking kids yammering in the background, TV on all, all day, the internet. They are fucking stifled and they're bored. If they get something that looks interesting through the post, in the words of Gary Ben Savenga, something that looked too good to throw away, they're going to spend time on it. And if you've done your work properly, then you've got a captive audience, an audience of one. No distractions. They're not on like, oh, I've got a 27 inch monitor now. I've got tabs I own. I've turned most of, the, in, most of the things off. So even on my, my lap, my, my desktop, I don't get many notifications. But I could get one or two, even as we're speaking. But you've got none of that. You know, nothing to distract them. But people just don't do it because it's expensive. Yeah, it's That's ridiculous. the ultimate nurturing gizmo. It's regular follow-up and direct mail. Especially if you serve a local market. Yeah. Especially. Um, we've said before, uh, worked with a particular company on a campaign where... Uh, we got people to essentially opt in for a direct mailbox straight to their house, uh, glossy new brochure, coffee mugs, tea, biscuits. And it fucking worked. It fucking worked. We were, um, it's likely it isn't around here anymore, but, uh, well, one of my mates, fellow Asper, you know, um, yeah. There's a local place, is it, it's either Apache or the other one, I can't remember which one it is, but they do pizzas. And they just deliver, do it, I think they do it once every week, they just deliver to every house fucking leaflets. And they do a fucking massive amount of business through these leaflets, pizza delivery, because hungry Saturday night, leaflet, it's a fucking no-brainer. Mm. Okay, that's not direct mail as in it's through the post, but it is because they just got some fucking little brown person to go around delivering them. You know, like that's what they do. Well, that's fact. Why wouldn't you do that? Oh, because the leaflets are expensive. <laughs> but it's all about ROI. Now, if they were to combine that with with really fucking tight Facebook retargeting, so you know these people are in town and they're thirty five, and it's about that time of night, so they're going to be drunk. Let's fucking hit the bastards with ads. <laughs> you know, for pizzas and things. That's a different thing. But yeah, they, they just don't do it. so. You know, direct a combination of direct mail. And daily emails because they're quick, cheap, and easy. Keep people top of mind. Yeah. Everyone should be doing it. Anyone can, and no, almost no one does. That's the do ultimate. Remember, so. mm, do you remember? I they, they they never actually followed through with it. They they were getting a bit of PR. I can't remember what for. Um, but they 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 were in the local rag that is you know free at the, all the shops you just help yourself with for it. I can't remember why, nor does it matter. Um, but I remember saying to them, all right, this is a fucking awesome opportunity. Uh, what we need is to run a Facebook ad of you holding this paper where you are on the front of it in front of like, uh, in front of a small shop in the town center that everyone would recognize. So anybody scrolling through their newsfeed would be like, I know that that where that is and um i just thought how powerful would that be not only are they sending direct mail they're now in the local press but let's get them online by targeting people that are in the area that are eligible for this free paper and uh show them hey you know almost like a, lo a local celebrity do you want us to work on your uh kitchen and uh they never went through with it i, I, I was very upset it was part of my whole five mile celebrity yeah. thing that I've coined that I thought existed, but I clearly dreamt about it and came up with a whole book in my head because I am certain I read a book called Five Mile Celebrity where I got this from, but no. So really what we talk about is, is it comes down to nurturing F word. We use the F word a lot. Yeah. Mm. I know we, we use that F word as well, but this is the focus <laughs> word, you know? Because people will not focus. The, the, and I think that it's a combination of things, a combination of ignorance, they don't know they're supposed to, a combination of ignorance and fear, because they, they fear if they focus on A, they can't have B, which is true. 
You know, if, you, if you're looking in one direction, you can't look in the other, you don't want to. What you need to be doing is, is deciding, and this is what we do in the Business Accelerator and also the Kickstart and what we did in Phoenix, the Lockdown Resurrection. You know, we, one of the first things we get them to do is to say, who's your ideal client? Who is it, who is it you want to sell to? And the more, you know, stuck. I think 51 or 50, yeah, they do. They do, really don't stuck. they? I think, I think it is 51 or 52 questions I put together with space for more, if you can think of them. And it doesn't, I mean, I'll be honest, it includes things like ethnicity, um, sexual preferences, the kind of car you drive, whether you've got kids or not, all those things. And, you know, and it, we have to preface it, it, don't we? Huh? We have to preface it by saying, look, this is what good business is. This isn't racism. Yeah. This isn't sexism. It isn't ageism. Oh, this is good business. And even if it is, that's not the point. The point is, it's your target market. But it, it does it does make sense because if you're selling, say, the kind of hair oils that people from with Afri African descent use on their hair, it makes sense for you to target those people wherever you can. There's no point in targeting someone like me who's fucking bald out of a sense of political correctness, thinking, well, it's only fair I advertise to him because you're wasting your money. It is illogical yeah. and irrational. And you're doing nobody any favours, let alone yourself. So, and if you don't, I, mean, I, I think, for instance, Phil, we spoke about Phil earlier. I think Phil would do really well targeting gay guys because mm. they love to look yeah. buff. And yeah. in which case, if you decide, if you say, okay, I want to target gay men who want to look fit, where's the obvious place to do that? Fucking grinder. Mm. Yeah. If I, no? if I was Phil, I'd also no be, if I was Phil, I'd also be trying to tap up uh, elite matchmaking services that work exclusively with gay men. Yeah. They do yeah. exist and get some form of synergy if there. I, if I was Phil, I'd be fucking his girlfriend every night. That'd be cool because she's quite hot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you showed me the pictures that he sent you that you weren't meant to send on. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, <laughs> the ones with the rabbit. <laughs> anyway, send this episode <laughs> to Phil. <laughs> I'm going to, don't worry, Mike. <laughs> Just hope Dean isn't here. <laughs> So yeah, you know, it's focus. It's thinking about exactly because Dan Kennedy says quite rightly because he's not stupid. Now the quickest way to go broke with direct mail marketing because it is, you know, there's an upfront cost to it, so it's potentially expensive, is to send the the, the same thing to everyone without any thoughts about segmenting them. Yeah. So you know, you, you need to do your, your your groundwork here, and of course, direct mail, sorry, daily email can help you do that. And here's something very simple. Now, if you're using a smart autoresponder, and they're nearly all smart like this these days, this is not back in the old days of AWeber 15 years ago when all you got was a bunch of fucking lists. Our market right, this doesn't is... know what a fucking autoresponder is, John. Okay, it's a system where you just put in someone's email address and you can send predefined emails to them. A little bit like chain letters, I suppose. Anyway, what you can do is you could say, write a blog. You, sorry, you could, you could write... A blog post, yeah, about, I don't know, a special kind of bathroom, for instance. Gold taps would do. All right? And you just write that on your blog. And then you send an email out to your list just talking about that. And so look, there's a link here. You can see some beautiful bathrooms with gold taps in. But you know, anyone who clicks through from that email is interested in gold taps. Bathrooms with gold taps, you know that. So what you can then do is you can send them more emails automatically because the systems can do this automatically. You can and you can arrange for your system to send them more information about gold taps. But you can also send them direct mail about gold taps. And you don't send it to anyone else on your list. You just send it to those people. Now, segmenting your list is so powerful. I mean, one of the guys I used to work with a long time ago, he used to do big events in London. Um, and he segmented his list. And what he did was he got some firm called Blue Sheep, I think it's called, Blue Sheep to segment his list for him. They do a deep data dive. So he got back a list which represented 40% of his normal mailing list. And he just sent his direct mail to that 40%. So he saved 60% of his mailing costs. He got the same response rate from that for his, for his event that he would have got for his the full list. So he saved 60% on his mailing and made the same amount of money. Well, that's vast because the secret to, to profits in direct mail and print advertising is actually saving on your 
your mailing. That's what a lot of it comes down to. It's ROI. So, and, and this was this event was, I think it was 1,500 quid or something. And the mailing wasn't cheap. It was like a 20 page letter I've written. So that wasn't in any way cheap. Um, so, you know, it was, but that that's the kind of thing you do. 40% of your list gives you the same response as 100%. And you, otherwise you're just wasting, you know, you're wasting 60%. That's kind of 80, 20 in a way. Well, it is 80, 20 and 80, 20 isn't just about the numbers 80 and 20, obviously. But yeah, that's why uh... you, you, you're picking up, that's focus. Because mm -hmm. is that their buying behavior showed him who his most responsive customers were. But it's the same thing if you're sending emails and you say, well, these, this guy, he, clicked, he always clicks on things about gold taps. Well, let's fucking sell him some gold taps then. Everyone else can fuck off. Then we'll sell them something else. We'll sell them aluminium taps or something. This guy yeah. likes gold taps. We know this. Let's push gold taps on him. Yeah, Anyone can do that. Let's send him some more emails about gold taps. Let's send him some direct mail. Let's retarget him oh. on Facebook. Um, yeah, so we, we, exactly. It's, so it's focus. It's, also, it's focus on, say again. I was just going to say, furthermore, you can easily do this by looking at the average wealth and the individual of the person who buys from you, uh, getting the postcodes they live in. Oh, and yeah. You've pretty much segmented the local audience you serve. You've now you've got an even more refined focus. Business yeah. is simple. And it, it, the thing is, people, I mean, I think most people, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know this is possible. It doesn't occur to them to do it. Um, and then when, when it does, I think there's this, I think there's an underlying fear of, well, if, what if it doesn't work? Or if you don't do it, it ain't going to work, is it? And it, and it is work. And, it, and I guess at times it thinks, there's this niggling feeling is it's, well, I'm restricting my market. I might miss some sales. Yes, you will probably. But that's not the point. So about ROI here. You better, you know, it's better off to, to send a direct mail to 100 people and get 10 people buying. But it would be to send it, say, to 1,000 people and get 11 people buying. We we're spoke about... Out, you know, we're trying to cut out that deadwood. And you do that with focus. We've spoke about this before, and it's probably worth doing a whole um, episode about it. But one, one thing we've noticed in the construction industry is uh, there's some really fragile yet massive egos um, because it's not hard to do big numbers in the construction industry. And, you know, you will get a rush out of saying, hey, we, you know, did a million year, a million this year. There, there's a real fucking, e that's a real ego feeder, but you know deep down the profits aren't there and you are worried about trying anything new that might fail that will make you look silly because you've built up this big ego on turnover where you don't even know the profits. And it's, it's, it's a big issue. And I don't hear anyone else speaking about it, but it's one of the biggest issues in construction that we've noticed, which is part of the reason we've turned our head more to focus on the domestic market because those serving B2B are just so focused on that turnover so lost it, it, with their it is, profits it is tougher. yeah it is tougher and there are some practical things like they don't get a chance in this they generally don't get a chance to speak to this, to this the, the decision fucking hell, the decision maker um well i started working with a quantity surveyor probably two or three years ago now i think it's three years uh, two and a half years anyway um and he, he was he, he was quite proud of his portfolio of clients big big ones hs2 people like that and I, and yeah, he was he was having the problem of you know constant price resistance and being fucked about. One of the first things I got him to do was just well change your focus. You know, what do you want, profits or ego? If you're prepared to let your ego go, and drop people like HS2 or just service what you've you've agreed to, but but focus your new clients on on businesses where you can speak to the decision maker and you can set your own fees. And that's what he did, and the the, the result is he's now selling at 312% over market rate, <laughs> you know? Okay, he can't say, I've got all these big fucking big name contracts now, great, but he's making three times as much money, you know? Uh, ego ego is very expensive and I can't afford one. <laughs> yeah. And most people go, we know one guy, if you remember, we spoke to a brickie just after COVID started last year. Really nice guy. Really nice guy, got no 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 criticism of the man at all. He was in, was in, in a real, I can't remember. But it would have been a real credit to our business. It'd have been great. It'd have been a perfect fit. He was doing over a million a year in turnover and didn't even know if he was profitable. He had no idea. 
Yeah. You could be making 100 k loss in one now, and that, that not that scary? To me, it is. I'd rather be doing 10k making, well, I'd rather be doing 100k making 10 than, than doing a million and making none, you know? It's so that, that's the rat race. That is focus. You know, we've got to think about these things. Now, if you want to get really focused, and this is, you know, if you want to pick off the best clients like a sniper, what? I, I just like the transition. If you want to get really <laughs> focused, I just liked it. It was smooth. If you want to, if you want to pick him off like a sniper, now let, let's 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 use the, the fucking the hand the the firearms analogy here. At the top end of things. You've got the shotgun, still an off shotgun, you know. You just fire enough fucking bled out there and you're gonna hit something eventually. Not got very good range, and you hit loads of shit you don't want to hit, but you'll hit your target probably. Might not kill it sometimes, you just damage it because the range is limited. But a shotgun is a very broad weapon. Now, if you want to not notch, uh, notch it up a little bit, you might you might have an automatic rifle. Again, you're firing bullets in bursts of three, or maybe have them fully automatic. And still the aim isn't great because it's being thrown around by the, the recoil and all the rest of it, and you don't have much time to aim it. So that's not a, quite a scatter gun, but you are tending to spray the fucking bullets around. Again, you'll probably hit your target, but you might hit some other things as well, and you get through a lot of bullets. But if you really want to do well, you will have the patience of a fucking snake, and you'll have something like a fucking sniper's rifle. Now you would you would be prepared metaphorically to sit in your fucking little hole under a canvas um or in your ghillie suit for two days pissing in your own underwear just to get a single shot at your target with a Barrett M82 sniper's rifle. I think the the near the, the furthest confirmed kill is over two miles done a couple of years ago by a Canadian soldier. Well, that is the epitome of of my I mean two the bullet is in flight for about five seconds. That's fucking epic. That's insane. Yeah, that is fucking epic. Um, I actually, I was at an event a couple of years ago, a very small event, I was speaking at it, and I got talking to this guy, and he was an ex-sniper. Um, and it was fascinating, because whether or not you, you agree with killing people in, in cold blood, because that's what it is, let's face it, it's not that he's a battle. If you are okay with killing people in cold blood or not, it doesn't matter. The, the mechanics of it, the, the, the technology that goes into making these bullets and these guns is fucking amazing. I, mean, I had a really good chat. With, I mean, I was fascinated. You know, typical yeah. fucking Aspie. Wow, you shot him where? <laughs> you know, um, but we we call it we call our bespoke system the the, the one we're still developing, the M eighty two, after the Barrett sniper's rifle. Because what you do is you you choose your targets literally, you know, man by man, woman by woman. You find out all you can about them. And you pick them off like a sniper's rifle. So to give you an example of how it works, Dan Kennedy, he's got this set of plastic drawers in his office. And just cheapo ones like you get from Viking. Sarah's got a load of the fucking craft stuff in there. She fucking does my head in. And each one had a name on it, you know? And what he would do is he, he knew these people. He'd either research them himself or he knew them. Um, or, or maybe if, you know, in our, in our world or your world, if you listen to this, you might, in construction, if you you know you might you you might look at a postcode area of affluent people, million plus houses. You might then find their names on Facebook, and then you might do some research on them. And eventually, you you build a, a portfolio of what they're like, what car they drive, um, whether they've got children, all these kinds of things. To find out their interests are. But guy at number sixteen, he goes fishing every weekend, and you have a drawer for each of these people. And what you do is every time you see something interesting about fishing, you might buy the book, buy the magazine, clip it out of the newspaper, put it in the drawer. And every month you package it up and you send them off. So what Dan Kennedy would do is every month he would package up these drawers, send them to his assistant and she would post them off. So every month these people are getting extremely targeted, non-salesy stuff for the most part um, on from this guy. That is the ultimate in marketing. You might think it's creepy. Some people might think it's creepy. It's not creepy at all. It's a pleasure to be targeted. Yeah, well, you were very is, upset when you found is, out you wasn't targeted. I'm going to go for a wee while you carry on. This is how Dan Kennedy got me into a day's consulting, at, you know, five figures, you know, and then also into doing an event with him probably four or five months later 
um, again, for he got a five-figure fee out of it. I made a lot of money too. Um, that was contingent on him making money. I had to pay his fee first. But he got me like that because what he did, he, I used to send him, I used to uh, do a published newsletter. I'd send him a copy every month. And then I sent him a copy of my book. So he knew who I was. I was on his radar. And this is why I did it, by the way. And he then, he picked his moment. And he sent me, I, I mentioned it in one of my newsletters, because he did read them then. He showed you read, read, read them. He, he used to read in one of my newsletters that one of the things I want to do is be, be a published fiction author. And this is vanity, pure vanity. I want to be published properly, not vanity publishing, not for money. I don't care if I get money for it. I want to be published by a publishing house. So I can, that's just one of the things to tick off my bucket list. He saw that and he responded by sending me a copy of his own fiction book with some unsolicited advice on how to go about it. And then at the end of that, he said, now, true business. And that's what kicked it all off. Oh, I've been reading your newsletter. Why don't we do something together? And that was it. Well, that was classic M82 behaviour. Yeah. Chet Holmes calls it Dream 100. If you, if you go on to Google, uh, sorry, on to your, uh, fucking hell, YouTube and Google Chet Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, Chet Holmes, Dream 100, video comes up, say about three or four minutes. Um, also, it's one of the chapters, might be chapter six, possibly chapter seven or something in his book, uh, The Ultimate Sales Machine. The, the book itself I find quite irritating at times, but that one chapter is pure gold. M82, Dream 100, call, call it whatever you like. Um, that is how to get the best clients. It's work. Um, it's relatively more expensive than anything else because, again, I'm not going to share too many details because it wouldn't be right. He's paying us and he doesn't want his IP spreading around the internet. But we've got a guy who's doing this now and things. You know, he's, selling it, he's selling stuff at multiple times market rate just because he does things better. He targets people. He delivers things in nice leather bound folders and stuff instead of just throwing it in a fucking envelope or use condom packet, you know? And the, the epitome of this is a girl called, I think her name was Colleen Bishop. Again, I'm going back about a dozen years now, where she hand wrote a long copy sales letter. I don't know how, long, how many of these she wrote, but she wrote a lot of them. You're probably talking of 30 or 40 of them. So it was a big job. And she mailed it out. And each letter, although it obviously had a, a, a common core to it, each one was bespoke to the person it was going to, just like I'm talking about now. It referenced the house they lived in, it referenced their habits, all those kinds of things. Could have been creepy and stalky, but wasn't if you, if you take, you know, if you saw them. And she made a million dollars off that mailing. So the question then is, if you knew for sure you'd make a million dollars, would you write handwrite 40 long copy sales letters? I probably wouldn't because I hate handwriting. But <laughs> you know, the, the, the overriding lesson to take away from this is the more personalised you can make your marketing, the more personalised you are willing to make your marketing, the more effort and time you're willing to spend on it, the more money you're going to make. We, we don't do it now because the ROI wouldn't be there. But I have no, no problem admitting to anyone listening to this. When we get to the point when we launch our Aurelius boardroom group, which is going to be, you know, probably 100k a year, when we launch that, we will be doing this kind of thing ourselves. Yeah. Um, we, because we know the more, well, that, as Dan Kennedy again says, you know, the one who's prepared to spend the most to acquire a new client always wins. Now, that sounds a bit daft when you think about it, but it's predicated on understanding what he's actually saying. And that is, you know, your numbers. Now, if we know, say, on average, out of every 100 people we approach, one of them comes on board for 100K. We could spend 50K on marketing to those 100 people. That's 2K each. And still be 50 grand in profit. No one in their right mind is going to spend 50K on marketing like that. No. But... That's because I don't understand what they're doing. And, and things like, you know, you, you want to, if you're selling high end stuff, and we're not talking necessarily hundreds of thousands of pounds, you're selling, say, 10K kitchens, 20K kitchens. I don't know what a high end kitchen would be. Say, say 20K kitchen. And you're making a 10K profit on it, which is not out of the question because we know people who are doing margins bigger than that already. So you're making 10K for a kitchen. Why would you not spend a thousand quid to get a client like that? 
Why wouldn't you? You'd be stupid not to, because you wouldn't just put the price up. And that allows you to do things like send video postcards. And they're 20 pounds. You all look like 20 quid for a fucking letter. Why are you an idiot then? You can send 100 for 2K. <laughs> all you need oh. is one. You only need one, and you've, you've more than made your money back. But people don't think they don't get this shit. And this is why we will, we are we do what we do so well. And while twonks on LinkedIn who pretend they're marketers, as soon as fucking COVID hits and they lose their clients, they go wah, and go back to bed and close the curtains. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's why we get paid the big bucks. That's why we don't give a shit about our competitors. Well, we don't have any competitors because no one's worthy of the name. Mm. So M eighty two. Anyway, no one really hates it either. No? I've got anything to hate on today. You've written one down. Have I? Is that all right? Oh, irrationality. Mm. Haven't we done it already, though? We can skip it, basically. We'll skip it. You, 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 skip it. I, 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 I find it. Oh, no, it's, it's exhausting doing one. <laughs> Anything like that, it's fucking hard work. What we uh, need to be doing is start a post. Well, I need to check where Holly's posting the one minute hate, but we definitely need to be putting them on our LinkedIn story. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, irrationality, irrationality was about these people who just fucking won't listen to reason. You know? People are idiots. Let's wrap this up. We've been going on for almost an hour in terms of the uh, podcast and well over an hour in terms of us. Right. So if you want to have more money, less work, less hassle, and fewer headaches by attracting top quality clients, selling to them at higher fees and having a constant stream of them delivered to you in your pipeline, hands off on autopilot and in the background, Doing just this kind of thing, because M82 can easily be turned into this kind of process as well. It's not it's not a one-shot wonder. What you need to do is go to ottpodcast.co.uk, avail yourself of the resources there, and then maybe get in touch. If you really want to get in touch, you need to help urgently email Holly, holly at growyourbusinessfuck.co.uk. In the meantime, stay safe, stay inside, wash your hands. Do not confuse Connor right there with Emperor, the Dark Lord, because <laughs> he looks like it. Emperor What's Palpatine. his name? Emperor Palpatine. Palpatine. Do not do not confuse him with Palpatine. I am the Senate. And do not shit on your fingers. See you later.